Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Connection with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. And we got ourselves a fair haul, including a couple of holdovers from last week, um, which we'll get to at the end of this video. Ooh. Excuse me. So, let's get started. We'll kick things off with continuation of Dawn of X in Marauders, number one. So, if you recall from House of X and Powers of Ten, Magneto and Charles Xavier have recruited Emma Frost to basically provide the the uh, Krakoan basic Krakoan drugs to people. Um, and they've also asked they that she bring in Sebastian Shaw to handle, you know, having well, the black market in the countries that legally won't be getting the mutant drugs. And in in uh, in exchange for the for those things, the Hellfire Corporation gets a fifty year exclusive contract with Krakoa, and Emma gets three seats on the Quiet Council: one for herself, one for Sebastian Shaw, and one for the unknown Red King. So we start off not long ago in Central Park. Um, Nightcrawler and Storm were gathered with a group of X-Men, or a group of students, uh, as well as Shadowcat, explaining to them what's going on with Krakoa. That, you know, Krakoa is a safe haven for all mutants, island nation just for mutants. You know, they're no more hunting, no more humans hunting mutants into extinction. And what we're doing is bringing mutants home. And so everyone's starting, everyone goes through, and Shadowcat starts to walk through, and the barrier won't let her through for some reason. She also broke her nose doing that. And so... Kitty has to charter a boat. As she can't but she's got she's got a sailboat and so she make she and Lockheed make their way there. The portal still don't work for her. But she runs the Iceman, they talk for a bit. Turns out she also, because of her circumstances being what they are, Logan sent Kitty a shopping list. Ribs from Rendezvous in Memphis. Canadian Club Whiskey. A couple cases ought to do for now. As many cases of beer as the hold on the boat will hold. He, though, and though he prefers bottles, cans will do, you know, Rough seas are a, po are a possibility. Kibano sandwiches from the wine cellar in the village. Just wants her to cram as many as possible into a cooler. Pomade. After all, we're going to keep, keep his hair just that right way, and well, now we know how. The dapper dude kind. And coffee. Well, while Wolfie is trying to convince Cypher to to get the island to grow it for us, it's still a work in progress. So. And yeah, she got all the stuff he, he wanted. And as they're walking by the gates, the Iceman notices one of them has no traffic. So he steps through to find out what's what.
Meanwhile, Emma Frost telepathically contacts Shadowcat to ask what's up. And a point is made that while all the other X-Men call her Kitty, Emma refers to her as Kate. And Emma's made a proposal to Shadowcat. And there's a boat involved. Part of it is the captaincy of a boat. And then some other details are explained from the rest of the world. In the country north of Alnum, the kleptocratic family that runs the country is cordoned off the entrance to Krakoa. Several gates in Brazil also have mutant hunting quadrupeds in the area. The idea being that not only will Kitty be smuggling in Krakow and drug pharmaceuticals, but she'll be smuggling out mutants. And apparently the position of Red King has been offered to Kitty by Emma. Meanwhile, catching up with Iceman, the uh, gate in question that had no traffic turns out is in Russia. And he explains who he is and, you know, why he's there. And remarks you can smell the vodka, you can smell vodka on the air. But a uh, Russian, Russian soldier in power armor explains that Russian mutants have no interest in going to Krakoa. Mutants either serve the state or get crushed like the small insignificant people they are. Turns out also that uh, there's a the armor that he's that he's wearing has a means of turning off mutant powers, which he does to Iceman. The, re the non-armored soldiers with him open fire just as Iceman jumps back through the portal. And. Shadowcat, now having, well, having broken into uh, Logan's stash of Canadian whiskey, it, well, <laughs> she kind of wants to go pick a fight. And so she talks Storm into it. She says to Storm, hey, maybe you could you know, help us out in the wind department. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Taipei, a woman is speaking to a crowd, explaining that uh, her husband touched the gate in a nearby park and disappeared. Bishop is looking into what's going on with this. Explaining that they have no record of her, of a woman's husband going through the gate. But he is trying to figure out just, you know, what's happened here. On Shadowcast's boat, turns out that uh, Pyro, the original Pyro nonetheless, Sinjin Allardyce, back from the dead, which could potentially explain his return or his appearance in Weapon in the last few issues of Weapon X. Was actually planning on stealing Shadowcat's boat. And he was he, at first apparently he was apparently one of the first mutants to be resurrected. He felt really special about that until he realized he was a test. To see if they could do it. And so, Kate and her team arrive. Um, the guy with the armor manages to take out uh, Storm and Iceman's powers. 
But Shadowcat phases through his armor, disrupting all of it. And so and saves most of the intangible so that she causes, causes enough trouble. And she shoots one guard in the knee, phases a rifle into another pair or the legs of a cu another couple. I mean it's actually pretty brutal. I was surprised to see Shadowcat do this. She lets off a couple smoke grenades inside a tank. And then there's a uh, Russian soldier who's attacked with a sword. He disarm she disarms him and takes the sword for her own. And Pyro gets to you utilize the flame that uh, that Lockheed can make and well control it. So the mutants, the mutants go through the gate, and, and Kate makes a speech. So short, but if you're a mutant and can't get to Krakoa, then the Marauders will bring you home. Later on, while on the boat, uh, Kate tell Shadowcat tells Storm that she can't live on Krakoa. Storm, it's like okay, you know, but I don't like the name of the Marauders. And Shadowcat simply explains she was on the spot, and uh, you know, isn't really entirely sure if the X Men want to be associated with what they have to do. And Storm agrees to stick around to stay by Shadowcat's side. However, Shadowcat's the one who deals with Emma. Storm wants no part of her. And so Shadowcat contacts Emma and says, Hey, yeah, I'm in. And also hoists up a flag. And she finally tell, and she also has Bobby start calling her Kate instead of Kitty. And we also get a nice little surprise of a new red diamond. All the best news and gossip from Bar Sinister. Sinister secret number eleven: Whispers on the wind that a certain mutant undergoing a new phase of their life is sitting on quite an offer. It won't last, but I wonder if they'd be surprised to know that they, to know they were not the first nor the second choice. Perhaps the third time's the charm. Presumably, that's referring, of course, to Shadowcat and the offer of the Marauder, of being ba the leader of the Marauders, basically. Um, I'm presuming that Storm was initially asked and turned it down. Uh, as for who else, I'm a, I have no idea who the other person would be. Citizen Secret number 12. Humanity's health and well-being was never a popular topic around Bar Sinister. But now that Krakoan medicines are keeping us afloat, we probably ought to pay attention to the changing of the tides at Hellfire Bay. We hear one of the sea seems to be carefully navigating this deep and red. So probably the uh, politics to, to come with within the title. Citizen Secret number 13. Speaking of the black and the white... Not everyone got their invite. Quite a faux pas. We hope there's not a fight. So, Hellfire Corporation is not the same as the Hellfire Club, as Celine and Harry Leland have, not, have apparently not been invited to, to rejoin, though they are both mutants and on Krakoa. Sinister Secret number 14. Humans wearing sheets always lead, lead to trouble. Who are these kooky new looky-loos crowding our gates? 
Oh boy. I, yeah, I, I, that's that's probably not that, that's probably pretty clear. Sinister secret number fifteen. We hear the slow boat is built to catch all the eyes, but it's the one under the radar that's really turning heads. As apparently the ship that Emma's building for Shadowcat is still being worked up, is still being put together, though she does have a boat. Next up, we've got Strike Force number two. So, where we left off in Strike Force. Blade gathered together Angela, Spectrum, Winter Soldier, Spider Woman, Wiccan, and. Oh, Spider Man, Wiccan, to take down a group of. shapeshifters called the Verdai. Um. Their MO basically being to appear as someone, or kidnap someone, and then take their place. Which they did with, to, well, Angela, Spectrum, Winter Soldier, Spider Woman, and Wiccan, as well as Doctor Doom. Anyway, while they were confronted by the, uh, while they were confronting the leader of the Verdi, Count Ophidian, they were surprised by Ophidian's court sorcerer, Damon Hellstrom, son of Satan, who Blade promptly killed. The difference, though, is that unlike when they killed Doctor Doom earlier, Hellstrom didn't revert into one of them or die. And then they got a call from Damien's sister, Damien's sister, Satana Hellstrom, explaining that uh, her brother's at, her brother's been at her, her bar and acting strangely. So, Blade and his crew head off to, to Vegas. Most of them having changed into... Some of them having changed into civilian clothes, some not. The, uh... Apparently the club run by Satana is called Second Circle. And it's gen it's underground. Like, you have to take an elevator under the... beneath the strip. So they arrive. Um, Satana immediately starts flirting with, with Angela. Then she explains to the group what's happened. Apparently, Damien showed up, bit Satana, and then he she put him in a suspension spell. And they're trying to keep the existence of Verdi secret. And trying to figure out, okay, how do we, you know... Now the next, of course, one. They need to, uh... Stop the Verdi. Two, they need to figure out if there, if he, if there are any others here as well. Yeah, there are. Spectrum realizes, though, that she's in Vegas. She's got all the power she needs. She can be at everywhere. <clears throat> so, well, Wiccan tries to do what he can for... Well... To bring in the dead Hellstrom and uh, take care of her diet, Hellstrom. Someone pops back up 
and does manage to uh, begin a little, little bit of a makeout session with Angelo. However, on the on the spiral staircase, Spider Woman and Blade encounter Satana. So they go back. Turns out, though, that this time they encountered was actually a ruse. The whole idea being that they would then kill the real thing and Satana would take her, and the Verdi would take her place. So now Satana, no, so Satana knows about the Verdi, but yeah. The, uh, They pour out of Hellstrom. The battle begins. They kidnap Wiccan, and they're off. So Tana then basically says, "Hey, look, um, I gotta do a revival for my brother, so GTFO." But it turns out that the Verdi, who is taking the place of Wiccan, well, he's going to. He's gone to Wicked and Hulklings. Yeah. Oh, good times! Alright, moving on to Punisher Kill Crew number four. Where we left off on the Punisher's uh, jaunt through. The, the Ten Realms, or at least some of the Ten Realms. After having rescued Foggy Nelson and Juggernaut, they uh, were going to return to Earth and re recruit the Black King, or Black Knight. Except for the fact that Black Knight is also tracking down uh, ver various. Uh, as guardian bag baddies after War of the Realms. So we pick up in Svarfelheim, where Black Knight is killing Dark Elves. And then the Punisher and his van show up. And Juggernaut explains to uh, Black Knight what's up. So they head to nowhere to see what see what they can do and to get it to gather and sell. They find uh, Zeltar the Miserable Then they take out a fire demon Uh, various other beasties. And uh, one of them leaves behind some some gems, which Juggernaut's about to take, but uh, Foggy's like, no, 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 no. The proceeds, I'm going to sell these gems, and the proceeds are going to set up a trust for the orphans back home. And it turns out this was that that particular one was the last one. But Frank says, no, 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 there's still one more. Casicla. Explain, explaining one thing that's why they needed the ebony blade. So it, that it could cut through because it could cut through Uru. Sigla tells the story about how he tried to kill Frank. Frank was kind of like, "Yeah, I'm not. That's not happening." And is now gunning for him. So they make their way in. 
Kasikla fires on the kill crew, but uh, yeah. Knocks that manages to briefly take out Juggernaut. As well as uh, Black Knight and Punisher. And he just decides he's about to eat. He's going to cook up Punisher to eat. And Foggy escapes, gets to the van, and is apparently heading back to Midgard. Or at least someone. Or at least to get reinforcements from somewhere. And that is where the issue ends. Alrighty, next on the list we've got... Contagion number four. Alright, so... Where we left off here... Um, seemingly... The, uh... Basically, the... the oh, what was it? Friggin' called. <sighs> the thing seems to have managed to stop the urchin, but at the cost of the, the rest of the Fantastic Four, Luke Cage, Doctor Strange, and a few others. Iron Man has a sample to study, but it appeared also that some of it had gotten onto his armor and was being, beginning to spread. However, others had also been infected that were not involved in the fight, the fight with the thing, so they're spreading it as well, including at Penn Station, where the Wrecking Crew is dealing with one. And they're not winning. So... Our heroes, along with Senor Magico, arrive, and they begin fighting. Mm. Fighting the Plague Bearer. Electra gets turned, as does Black Tarantula, and White Tiger. Punisher and Moon Knight hold them off while everyone else escapes. And basically, the uh, the League of International Magic Users, or practitioners, are doing what they can to heat the barrier they spell they put up, put the place up, but they're, they're getting exhausted. Senor Magico explains, yeah, uh, okay, maybe Strange was right. Uh, on Avengers Mountain, the fungus has taken over. Everyone is... Everyone has fallen. Various heroes are exploring, trying to find the, the nest and the, uh, the root of the, of the fungus, but yeah. Punisher seems to have found stumbled upon something, but is taken prisoner as well. The remaining heroes, League of International Magic Practitioners, Pile Driver, not a, not actually a hero, The Thing, Moon Knight, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, a few others. I'm trying to figure out what to do. However, Moon Knight has an idea. As apparently the, uh, the fungus is able to utilize the powers and personalities of the, uh, the infected, well, if there's anyone who knows that they have a lot of, to have multiple people running around in their head, it's Moon Knight. So he says that he lets the urchin take him, and he gets inside. However, he doesn't know exactly how he's going to get out, but he'll figure it out once he's in there. 
And it's also the only plan that, that anyone has. Back on uh, 42nd Street, though, the League of International Magic pra Magical Practitioners fa fall falters, and as, as does their wall. So and so, your so magic goes informed, and so they go to 42nd Street and to, to at least bring. But it's not. It didn't take long for the fungus to get to the uh, everyone else. And so, yeah, it's now got every. It's got a lot of people, and that's where the issue ends. With things looking very not good, to put it lightly. All right, now I mentioned we had a couple of holdovers from last week. First off is History of the Marvel Universe, Part Four. Um, ah, where we left off, I think we were we got to around basically the mid seventies when it comes to what what all happened. So once again, we begin with uh, an aged Galactus talking with an adult Franklin Richards. Uh, Franklin explains that um, he doesn't really think of Galactus as someone able to experience fear. Maybe, I mean, maybe of Reed Richards, but he's also just surprised that uh, he remembers all these beings. Howard the Duck, Kid Colt, but uh, it's explained that much of what he's been, what was relating on Ondor was gleaned from the planet T-37X, the home of the Watchers. So he continues, we get, to, we get a very condensed version of the Dark Phoenix Saga, as well as the, the appearances of Moon Knight, Nova, Werewolf by Night, Captain Britain, Dazzler, Spider Woman, Jessica Drew. Carol Danvers, uh, Korvac, the as well as the Korvac saga, um, the time that uh, the fourth the fourth celestial host came to. Past judgment, final judgment on the earth. We get the appearance, the origin of She-Hulk, the uh, banishment uh, of Yellow Jacket from the Avengers, the humans moving from uh, the, the Himalayas into uh, the blue area of the moon, the death of Captain Marvel, the appearance of the new of the new mutants, the death of Elektra. Uh, Monica Rambeau becoming a, taking on the Captain Marvel and later Spectrum or Captain Marvel mantle as well as the Spectrum identity. James Rhodes becoming Iron Man, Beta Ray Bill being found worthy to wield Molnir. Secret Wars. Of course, you can't talk about Secret Wars without talking about the new duds Spider Man came back from it with. And so we get the black costume, we get the power pack, the West Coast Avengers, Cloak and Dagger, the original five X-Men uh, teaming back up for, to become X-Factor, Mutant Massacre, um, Angel, and of course, the big, uh, one of the big results from that, Angel's, the maiming of Angel and his eventual uh, transformation to Archangel. We next get the Masters of Evil and and their uh, siege, the time they laid siege to Avengers Mansion. We also get Iron Man's so-called Armor War. Um, Wendell Vaughn becoming Quasar. The formation of Excalibur. Inferno, 
the for, the brief, the albeit brief formation of the Midnight Suns, um, the formation of the New Warriors under under Night Thrasher, Cable turning the New Mutants into uh, X Force, the initial appearances of Deadpool, Infinity Gauntlet, Infinity War. Operation Galactic Storm, Executioner's Song, Maximum Carnage gets brought up, mm. The Wedding of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, The Clone Saga, which I found it very amusing, The Clone Saga, which I, which I should state, when you put all the various issues together, comes out to be well over 100 individual comic books. Can be condensed to a single page. Um, the formation of Generation X has gone into the Age of Apocalypse is brought up. Um, also, uh, Onslaught, which is actually where things end with... The uh, Avengers of Modest Four seemingly sacrificing themselves to uh, defeat Onslaught, but uh, only to re reappear a, a year later, having been reborn into new, new and similar, similar but not identical lives, and brought back a, after a year by a young child, Franklin Richards. And that's where the issue ends. It looks like we'll be doing, I guess, the latter half of the 90s next issue. And probably part of the 2000s. And, of course, there's also the annotations. going into more detail about everything that is brought up. Though it does list Ileana as being the first victim of the legacy virus. Um, one thing that is also brought I've neglected to mention when they had going over the various stories. When it, when uh, the issue brings up uh, Ex Executioner's Song, it does mention that uh, Strife's final revenge was the Legacy Virus, which targeted mutants. Alright. And we got one more uh, book for this video, also a holdover from last week. Tales from the Dark Multiverse, Batman, Nightfall. Okay, so some comics history. Back in the early 90s, there was a Batman story, well, technically speaking, three Batman stories. That was a long event that covered that crossed into all the Bat books. Nightfall, Night Quest, and Night's End. Um generally referred to as with the catch-all of the Nightfall Saga. Um, the Nightfall Saga introduced Bane and saw one of the first major, one of the first points when someone replaced Batman. Um, after Bane broke Batman's back, Batman appointed Jean-Paul Valley, Azrael of the Order of St. Damas, formerly, formerly of the Order of St. Damas, to take on the Batmantle. And he did. And was much more brutal than Bruce Wayne ever was. And he also started to descend into madness. Mainly from, well, not so much madness, but basically the, uh, the programming which turned him in with that he had gone through his entire life to become Azrael is what he succumbed to. Um, he 
he defeated Bane, and he retooled the bat the bat suit, making it making a suit of actual armor out of it, which actually had built-in gadgets and gizmos. Um, and to be perfectly honest, it's a pretty the Azrael bat suits were actually pretty neat looking. Um, even, yeah, yeah, they are very much products of the 90s, but they still actually kind of look cool. If it weren't for the fact that they were a symbol of a more brutal take on the character, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't surprise me to see those outfits pop back up. But yeah, they are, like it's more brutal takes, so. Anyway. Eventually, Batman's spine would he Bruce Wayne's spine would be healed. He would uh, learn some new martial arts through, through Lady Shiva, and then would return to Gotham. During that time, Azrael killed someone, and so that was kind of the final. That was kind of the point where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I got to go back and reclaim the mantle of Batman. And so he did. They fought it out, and uh, yeah, Bruce was victorious. Azrael, Azrael stuck around actually for a good long while. Uh, he was eventually killed off. And then, the more more recently, another Azrael popped up. Also after Nightfall, for a brief period, um, Dick Grayson took over the mantle of Batman. Mainly so that Bruce could continue to heal. Um, so, we start off explaining the multiverse as a collection of possibilities and realities. A vast landscape of worlds held back from darkness by the thinnest of barriers. But what is that barrier? A moment. And so we see the creation of a very, very truncated version of the creation of the Batman Who Laughs. And the monitor is... this. Our narrator explains he's tried to keep his, eye, his gaze on the multiverse. Tried to ignore the world beyond the barrier, but he no longer can. That's another thing. The dark multiverse is the home of the characters known as the Dark Knights. Um, each one being a different multiversal version of Batman combined with another DC character. Uh, for example, the one I mentioned just now, the Batman Who Laughs, it's a Jokerized Batman. There's also the Murder Machine, which is a combination of Batman and Cyborg. Red Death, a combination of the Flash and Batman. Devastator, a combination of Doomsday and Batman. Um, oh... The Merciless, which is basically a combination of Ares, the God of War, and Batman. But yeah, you get the idea. And it's not just... It's not just... There's more to the Dark Multiverse than just the Dark Knights. So we get a quick recap of what happened in Nightfall. However... In this world, Batman fell. Azrael... One re basically recrippled Batman and said to Bruce, you know, told him, I promise you, Bruce, you are right to pick me. I am what Gotham needs, and I'll show you. And he explained that in the years that followed, Gotham's the other widespread change. A purging fire, an extensive remaking. Gotham is, is a city of codes, of searing tenants that pr protect its people and its resources from the world. Once again, it's a city that faces great change. We're now thirty years. It's now thirty years later. Um, Jean Paul has taken over Wayne Manor, renaming it the Dumas Home. Um, apparently, it was a man. Man, it was a cardinal apprehended. 
An outsider named Luis Ramos, who provides safe passage by the penguin, in possession of various weapons. There is a woodroop pandemic spreading in the outside world. A few years ago, it was a, the parasite cataclysm in the, the metropolis. And basically, from the looks of it, penguins can get executed. Turns out, though, that uh, Jean Paul is using venom to uh, basically be more powerful. Goes to Wayne Tower, where we discover he's keep, he's been keeping Bruce Wayne all these years, or at least what's left of Bruce Wayne, which at this point is his upper torso and his head. And apparently, all, and Azrael's more than happy to kill Bruce, so long as Bruce. Uh, Gives Azrael's, Azrael's approval. And so Ramos is, is killed, and then Cobblepot and Ramos are both killed by the Cardinal, but explosives go off. Something is being planned. So, we have the, the appearance of another outsider who comes to rescue Bruce Wayne. Turns out this outsider is the son of Bane. He produces venom naturally, and if he needs it, he can use it. So, he, he, he frees Bruce. But we cut back to Others trying work basically the, the cohorts of Bane's son dealing with uh, the order and Azrael and his people. And we then learn that the son of Bane is also the son of Lady Shiva. And they have a plan. They've got a plan to basically give Bruce a new body. To basically give Bruce Wayne a new body. Asriel has a brief vision of Saint of Saint Dumas and the cathedral has has been secured by his horses, but the war still rages. There are heretics overrunning the streets. It will be a long fight. However, he returns to the way, to the Dumas home only to discover that his venom sash is gone, and his wife has sided with Lady Shiva. So Azrael kills his wife, and also Bruce appears. Fight breaks out though. Um, it is by a nanotech that Bruce has still got a body. Explains that. Uh, the nanobats give him flight and reach he never had before. They also absorb the genetic profile of everyone they touch. So they everyone he kill, the human might kill, lives on through him. Azrael tears off the arm of uh, Bane's son, basically kind of a you know, hey, you make you naturally make venom? Cool. My sash is gone, so I've now got a sash whenever I need it. Uh, Batman shows back up. The son of Bane 
breaks Azrael. And Batman ends up saying that, uh, well, sure, they, Lady Shiva and her son came to, Bat, to Gotham to save the world, reconnect Gotham, use her to heal people, to heal a wound. But the truth is, some wounds don't heal. It's broken, cannot always be fixed. Sometimes it must be made new. And it must take care of itself. What's good for the world is not what's good for Gotham. And so, Batman kills Shiva and her son. And it seems Bruce will be even has gone even further. Is going to go even further than now. He crucifies. Azrael displays the body. And that is where the issue ends. That's it for this part of the roundup. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, live long and rock hard.